Welcome to the third Thursday demonstration. I'm Roberta Romeo, the second vice president of the Florida Watercolor Society. And this is the third of our monthly demonstration series featuring our convention workshop instructors. Now, before we start, we have a few reminders. First, the window for entry into the annual exhibition closes on June the 5th. Second, the convention registration opens on June the 10th for our live convention at the beautiful Charlotte Harbor Events and Conference Center right on the water in Punta Gorda. The third reminder is our workshops, in, uh, our workshops at the convention in September are filling up fast. So don't be like me one year when I thought, oh, I'll wait and I'll wait and I don't know if I can go and I don't think things have worked out and I didn't get in. Had to go on the wait list and I still didn't get in. So don't do that. You'll kick yourself for that. And then the last thing I want to remind you about is our Thursday demonstrations can be viewed on the Florida Watercolor Society website about 48 hours after they run. And now, I have the delightful honor of introducing Mark Mahaffey, our judge and juror for the 51st Annual Exhibition. He is our demo artist this evening, and he's a signature member of AWS, NWS, TWS, and, oh, TWSA, sorry, uh, and is a nationally and internationally award-winning watercolor artist. His works are included in corporate offices, in the public and private collections all around the world. Mark's demo this evening is gonna reflect what he will be covering in his September workshop. And it, the title of that is Experiment for Fun, Design and for Success. Doesn't that sound so exciting? Uh, it runs the gamut from representational to experimental, intuitive abstraction. It's gonna be fast moving, fun, mixed media workshop, and it's sure to help your skills go to the next level. If you have any questions during uh, the demonstration, you'll see your Q and A uh, section up at, on the top of your top bar or the bottom bar, depending on what, um, platform you're using, but it's the Q&A section, and that's where you'll want to put your questions. You can put them in anytime during the demonstration, and then after the demonstration, we'll go to Mark and give him those questions, and he'll answer them for us. And now, it is my honor to present Mark Mahaffey. Hello, everybody. Um, I know that I am unmuted. Um, I think Roberta has most of you muted. Um, so uh, this is my studio setup. And usually when I teach in my studio, there's my webcam. Um, it's earlier in the day and we're in the evening here in Michigan, same time zone as you folks in Florida. And it's really, really cloudy. We're going to get thunderstorms tonight and most of the day tomorrow. So it's very dark in my studio. So I have my artificial lights on, hence the glow. Um, but we, we can make do. So what I'd like to do for you tonight before we open it up to questions, and I'm sure there'll be lots of good questions, is give everybody an overview of what we'll be covering during the workshop. It's kind of... Mm, something for everyone, or let's put everybody on a frustration level. Um, so we're going to be running the gamut from traditional transparent watercolor on untreated cotton paper based on photographic references to brave painting on, on alternative surfaces, the first one being golden brand gesso on watercolor paper. And that would be transparent watercolor on that gesso, which works wonderfully and leads to brave painting, to experimental water media painting, because we'll add um, water soluble markers, crayons, pencils, and gouache into the transparent mix. 
and that will be um, non-objective work or abstractions on UPO paper. So it will be sort of a mixed workshop with, I hope, a logical progression from one to the other. So what I'd like to do for tonight before we have questions is sort of give um, not necessarily a demonstration, maybe a short demonstration, but sort of an overview of what we're going to be covering. So as I do this, if you have questions, it might be a good idea to either jot them down or write them. I don't think we're using the chat for these. Um, you have another device for questions, but... Um, since you can't ask questions as they occur to you, I can't an answer them as you ask them, and it's at the end, then do write them down and I'll be happy to do my best to answer those. So I am gonna switch cameras to this camera instead of the computer camera, which will allow me to show you two of my sketchbooks. This is a old one, filled. Looks like it has a photograph sticking out of it. So I'm just going to look. Oh, yeah. So we'll come back to that one. This is my current sketchbook. So um, like a lot of folks, I do work from photographic references. So I keep um, two cameras with me all the time. My um, Canon point and shoot, which is downstairs by my computer, and then this camera. So this camera is the one everybody has with them all the time. And if something captures my interest, then I pull one of the two cameras out and take a photograph. Those photographs come back and get um, uploaded into my computer. Um, and I really never delete them. I bought a computer with extra storage so I could always go back and we're pushing 60,000 photographs on my desktop computer now. And then I take a look at them and the possibles, and usually it's three or four out of a hundred possibles that I might like to make a painting from, um, those get dropped into Photoshop, resized, occasionally messed with a little bit, and then printed out at four by six. Um, and then from that photograph, I go here. And the sketchbook is the simplification of all the information that a photograph gives. So I'm just going to flip through this. This one happens to be a lot of pen and ink at the beginning. Um, and some are just really quick sketches for memory, not leading to paintings, and some led directly to paintings. I really should paint that bar scene, um, but never got to it. So these, this is where I distill my ideas in the sketchbook. And these are small, three by four inches, wild turkeys, I'm still working on this design a commission, which I hardly ever do, somebody that got to my fishing site before I got there. I live 23 miles straight west of Traverse City, for those of you that know Michigan, and this is an alley in Traverse City. And then a friend of mine on her phone backlit rather dramatically, um, at a hotel, believe it or not, in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, we went there to see the traveling Van Gogh exhibit. So uh, this is fairly typical of the way I work from a photographic reference. The photograph is long gone. Seldom do I keep the photograph available when I paint. I paint from this distilled imagery. So I rearrange the shapes and then I assign uh, one of five values to every shape, and then um, work from this. Uh, and then color interpretation is left up to me. Pardon my paperweight, but I'll put the painting that resulted. And this one happens to be acrylic on panel, but you'll get the idea. There's the value plan, the sketch, and then there's the painting. So the color interpretation was up to me. So it was early in the morning, hence the backlit trees. A nocturne, which I've been doing quite a few nocturnes lately. 
So again, this is about three by four inches. These value plans don't take me very long at all, um, but they give me enough information that I can work on the painting. And somebody mentioned plain air, Roberta. I think you mentioned plain air. I do paint in plain air. I try to get out once a week. And most of the time, that's in acrylic. So here's the value plan. And then here's the resulting painting, which actually follows the value plan fairly closely. This is acrylic on panel. And that's a popular plain air painting site of mine. So about these days, about half of my work is either mixed water media or acrylic, which is additive, not subtractive like watercolor can be. Um, and I like acrylic for plain air painting because I mess up a lot. And when I mess up, acrylic dries in three or four minutes, heavy bodied acrylic. So I can mess up, realize I have the wrong value or the wrong hue or the wrong temperature. And then I can wait four or five minutes and just repaint it. So this is always helpful. And I don't always paint what you see in the sketchbook. This was today's sketch. And here's a small one. I believe I have that painting available so I can share the painting. I don't need a lot of information to do the painting. So this is the value plan. It's three by three and a half. And then here's the resulting painting. So it was just enough information for me to go after this quarter sheet with transparent watercolor. This, by the way, is watercolor on gessoed paper. You can see the granulation and even um, totally transparent very finely ground pigments will granulate on this surface. So like alizarin will granulate, phthalo blue will granulate, not a great deal. And those colors which naturally granulate like manganese blue um, will really uh, show the texture of this surface. So I use a five value system. White, light, medium, medium, dark, and black or very dark. And then I usually try, usually uh, try to put um, my focal area, my center of interest in the sweet spot of the rule of thirds. And I do fudge that quite a bit. Um, I am not a huge proponent of rules with my own work, um, but it is helpful to know the rules before you start breaking them. So that's my procedure for most of the work that I do. We'll go back and see if we can find. <laughs> this, here's the value plan. This painting is in the Transparent Watercolor Society of America's annual exhibition. Let's go back to this one. So I did paint this painting and I think I have it available. I'll check my pile of paintings. Yes. So here's the painting that resulted. And it's blowing out just a little bit up here because of the light source, but you get the idea. And this painting interior hotel painting, again, transparent watercolor on twice gessoed uh, one quarter sheet cold press 300 pound. And I'm pretty sure that will be on your materials list. You will let me know if you don't already have that materials list. And if you do, I might like to see it again to make sure that you have everything that you need for the workshop. So that's basically my procedure for working in a representational fashion. Here's an older sketchbook. This one's filled, so completely filled. 
with ideas for paintings. And just because I put it in the sketchbook doesn't mean that I painted it. It takes me somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes to do these smaller value plans. And that 10 to 20 minutes has saved me many headaches, many heartaches, and many full sheets of watercolor paper. Um, years ago, I started planning for success instead of hoping for success. And um, once I started planning, uh, my success rate went way up. So some I never get to, like I thought that was an effective plan and then never really got to the painting because something else grabbed my attention. So these things happen. I'm enthralled with the cedar trees that line our lake shores. So we live, fortunate to live within walking distance to Lake Michigan. So I can walk to the beach in about 20, 25 minutes. Um, and then we also live in the middle of the 14,000 acre Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore Park. Um, so out my side door, I can go for a walk in the woods for ever, essentially. So these, this is where, when I get an idea, it gets distilled here in value. These are the values that I intend the painting to have. So let's go here and look at a photograph. So here is a photograph. This happens to be Traverse City behind these trees. This is the West Grand Traverse Bay and you can just see East Grand Traverse Bay. And this is high up in a neighborhood with roof and bushes, grass in the foreground, um, cypress, salt cypress covering up the roof. What I thought was intriguing really about this was how these pine trees were silhouetted against the bay. So my value plan completely eliminated the house, most of the foreground, the bushes, and the small columnar um, bald cypress. And immediately I went to my focal area being the silhouetted um, pine trees against the lighter, the light filled um, distant shore and, and water. And so this was my plan and I was teaching that day. So I did two paintings and these are transparent watercolor handled in a transparent fashion on untreated cotton paper. I know that phrase quite well, being a member of both Watercolor West and PWSA. Um, and they require transparent handling on untreated cotton paper. So the first time I did it, I followed the values, but decided to do a warm dominant painting. So the warm dominant painting really felt like a warm summer day. It was a warm summer day. And I, I was happy with the mood that this dominant warm temperature created. And I thought, well, if we can go warm, why not go cool? So I did a second one, which I rather like better. Um, usually I gravitate towards a warm dominance, but not this time. So this is a cool dominant painting but I went across the color wheel in the focal area and picked up some warmth. So we get some red, orange, orange across the color wheel from the blue, green and blue. So, and we'll talk about color use also in our workshop. This all occurs, believe it or not, in the first day, <laughs> day and a half, maybe. A lot depends on how fast people choose to go. So, then we come to this surface, which is a great deal of fun. And here's a small, this actually, uh, Roberta asked, this painting was done in plain air, transparent watercolor on 140 pound cold pressed paper with two coats of golden brand gesso on both sides. And I'm emphasizing that brand name, Golden, because I know exactly what that brand does when I put transparent watercolor paper on it. Um, and I don't know exactly what the other brands will do. Invariably, excuse me for just a second, invariably, 
I teach a workshop, somebody has, I'm going to call it an off brand and the other brands work fine for their intended purpose, but like Liquitex or um, uh, I don't know, any other brand of Gesso and they'll use it because they have it. Um, but I can't guarantee results with those other brands. I can guarantee results with golden Gesso. Um, and so buy a small jar. Uh, it's worth the money. You can use it for other things as well. The reason I love that surface is, number one, the textured granulation that you get. Number two, the underlying texture you can get if you allow the brush strokes that you apply the gesso with to show. So I'm pulling this up close. I don't know if you can see. Can you see the brush strokes underneath and here? underneath. So if you're aggressive and you allow the gesso to squirt out from your brush, um, you can incorporate that texture into your painting. One of the primary reasons I love this for plain air is because I mess up so much. Also for studio work, and this always appalls people, um, but this painting has been dry for uh, months. And this is a paper towel that I just squirted water on. And we're going to lift this paint right off of here. Now there's a little stain, but that's how easy corrections are on this surface. So conceivably, there are no mistakes. Um, if I wanted to get back even lighter, I could work at that a little bit more. But then it's always, you know, quite easy to repaint. Oh, we'll do just a quick little repaint to show you what I mean. Incorporate that, incorporate that right into what was there. And then if you wanted to lift, like I lost this tree trunk, no big deal. And it lifts right through dried paint film. And we can add some of the bread back in the tree trunk, bring the viewer's eye there. So it's a very manipulative surface. Um, very easy to make adjustments, to lift. Um, there have been times where, where I get totally frustrated and just take a paper towel and wipe the whole thing off and start again. And we have the other side too. So that's a very forgiving surface. It leads to brave painting, brave painting. So I'll share a couple others with you. So this is a mile from my house. Those of you that live in Florida will probably not appreciate that one. The dead of winter, we had a very long winter um, this year. We've just essentially went from winter to summer um, with a really short spring. But, um, you know, two to three feet of snow, that's pretty normal. Um, sometimes the snow banks on the side of the road get so high that you have to put poles in the corners to, to um let no, folks know. Sometimes people will put a ball on their antenna to let folks know that there's a car coming. Um, we had a lot of snow and it was cold for quite some time. Then we had a rainy cold spring. So a mile from my house, transparent watercolor on gessoed paper. Deep in the woods. Winter again. So you're seeing my winter paintings. 
winter in the park, not far from my house. And then an abandoned farmhouse, which is about two miles from my house. All transparent watercolor, all on two coats of gold and gesso on watercolor paper. So all representational imagery, all with a value plan in my sketchbook to go from. So we all know there's more than one way to paint. So I'm a compartmental painter. Some of my work has hidden meanings. I will make social statements, hidden meanings, uh, even political statements in some paintings, um, and then have the viewer um, search or struggle to find the meaning. Sometimes I'll give hints, sometimes I'll explain, and sometimes I won't. Another compartment is the representational work I just talked about um, because I spend so much time outdoors. I love manipulating the shapes that I see, like a sky shape or a tree shape or a hill shape or a road shape um, to make a decent composition and then manipulating color to make it exciting for the viewer. I also go internally pure design and try to use design, shape making, texture, line, um, and value, occasionally value becomes an issue, um, to make an interesting non-objective painting. And that's where this next series of work um, comes from. So usually I start and then go from a start and I call it intuitive painting. It's really not intuitive painting or it's intuitive painting based on, let me think, 61 years of painting time. So I just turned 71 and I started painting, seriously painting when I was 10. So that's a lot of brush time and a lot of design time and a lot of study time and a lot of worn out brushes, a lot of failed paintings, a lot of failures, <laughs> more failures than most people. And so this compartment is part of, part of that history. And I greatly enjoy it because the only person I really have to um, make happy with this is myself. So I do these to please myself. They do not sell as readily as my landscapes. I will give you that. Um, but when somebody loves them, they really love them. So these paintings are all mixed water media on UPO. I do the same thing on large canvases, 40 by 40, 48 by 48, 40 by 60, 48 by 60, but with acrylic and all additive. On UPO, I can be subtracted. So gouache is resoluble, transparent watercolor is resoluble when dry, which means I can put it down and then lift it, put it down and lift it, put it down and lift it and create layers. So this is gouache and transparent watercolor and water soluble crayon dosh. Crayons. So I love simplicity and then have a tendency to paint complexity. Um, so I really appreciate those that can get to the gist and leave it. I get to the gist and fuss sometimes and then kick myself later, we've all been there. Sometimes I just go with it. We either lean towards organic shapes, flowing curved shapes, or we lean towards hard edge geometric shapes. And I lean more geometric than I do organic. And as long as one is dominant over the other, you can have both going on. Think a city scene with lots of trees, bushes, and 
organic shapes for people. So, but as long as one is dominant, dominant, the, the, the principle of design dominance is, is large. It's big in my head um, because a dominance of a lot of things provides unity for the work. So we'll, we'll talk about the elements and principles of design during the workshop. It's not a specific design workshop. If it was, we'd get half the people to sign up probably. Um, but I do sneak it in on you as we go. So that's basically the gist with a lot of stuff left out and well, you know at least two demonstrations a day of our workshop in September. It will be fast paced, it will be fun. I will give answers to questions and the occasional opinion about painting as well. So Roberta. Yes. If you would like to field any questions. I um, okay. Um, Ron, do we have a, a something that we're going to show first? There I am. Uh, I there think, you are. Uh, Mark has just done the uh, uh, demo. Instead okay. Of, instead of the recorded one. All right, so we're just going to go ahead and go to the questions. And we have a few questions here, Mark. Good. Uh, let me go. Uh, the first one uh, is from Kinsley, and she wants to know, why do you only draw on one side of your sketchbook? Oh, um, that's a really good question. And yeah, that I, is. I have a ready answer. So this is graphite. You know, I use a 5B or 6B graphite pencil to do these because I want that soft pencil so I can get dark darks. Um, let me go back to the camera. Let's go back to this one. Yeah. So I can get really dark darks with that soft pencil. Um, but if I drew on this side, because they're both soft, they would sully each other. And there's a slight hint of this. Um, so that always goes to a clean, clean side like that. So I don't draw on both sides. I will occasionally put two drawings on one page, but very seldom one on opposing pages because I don't want that to, to interfere and mess it up. So when I'm done with the sketchbook, like this sketchbook is um, not done, but when I'm done, yes, this is the finished sketchbook. It goes all the way to the end. So when I'm done with a sketchbook, I take this sketchbook to like one of the printing places um, like Kinko's or any number of printing places, and they will um, let you or they will make copy of every page and then put it in a binder for you with a circle binder at the end and then facing uh, plastic on both sides for your sketchbook. So then you have a eight and a half by 11 bound book of your sketches that can be shared. That's what I travel with actually. Um, and then I just archive my original sketchbook. And by that, I mean, it goes on the shelf. And then when I croak, <laughs> other people can worry about it because there'll be a whole <laughs> stack of sketchbooks to look through. Um, and then uh, I can travel and teach with the copy that I make at the printing store. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, Richard asked about uh, what pencils and what kind of sketchbook you use. And I know you said you use the 5B or 6B graphite pencil. Do you do. use any others? And what is that brand of the sketchbook? Yeah, and then I use Micron pens also. Um, but Micron pens, I leave out of value, usually um, four values. Um, the pencils I use are like General's pencils. Um, Grab a couple. Yes, so there's a good one. Yeah. So, you know, I just buy a bunch of pencils uh, when I can do that. So, this is a 4B pencil. It gets really dark easily. And then this is a 2H. And sometimes I'll use a 2H if I'm doing a, a transfer, tracing paper transfer from. Uh, sketch to full size tracing paper contour outline mm -hmm. of all my shapes. And then I'll transfer that to the watercolor paper. So I'm not erasing on my watercolor paper. So I use a 2H, too hard, 
pencil for that. And then occasionally, especially when I travel airports and stuff, instead of the messier graphite, I'll draw with the micron, the waterproof micron. Okay. And what was that sketchbook? Do you have a yeah. screen? I, I don't, you know, heck if I know. I just buy them. Hanson make cans. I think these are Canson sketchbooks, but you know, they're not very big um, because my drawings aren't that big. This is like four inches by five inches, the drawing. So these are, I think, five and a half by eight sketchbooks. They're a good travel size. I keep one in the truck and two or three here in the studio, plus a whole bunch of other sketchbooks. You always have to have someplace to draw. Right, right, yeah. for sure. Okay, Richard has another question. He says, what are the disadvantages of using gesso under your watercolor? Can you still mix your colors on the paper? Yes, absolutely you can. As a matter of fact, I approach that method, if you will, uh, two different ways. One, I cover the paper completely with a middle value and let it dry. And then I lift all of my lights, the lightest shapes, I lift them with a thirsty brush and then add my darks in around them. That's one way to work. The other way I do it is I spray the whole sheet till it's wet. And then I dump a bunch of watercolor on it and let it run and flow and move all over organically, mixing on the paper. Mm -hmm. Then I let parts dry or I jump right in and start lifting shapes and adding shapes. And then it works sort of almost traditional watercolor where you would work wet and wet for the background. And then as the paper dries, work through the middle ground. And then the final, uh, as the paper is dry, do the final calligraphic marks in dark in the foreground. So kind of traditionally that way, but I get to manipulate that surface um, to the max because even if it dries, I can lift it off again with a brush or a paper towel. Awesome. Well, now Candace asked, what were the advantages? And I think you just covered that. Do you find any disadvantages with using your watercolor on gesso paper? Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's difficult to get really dark darks without them becoming shiny. And the reason is, is that paint, instead of sinking into the cotton paper, um, it uh, sits up on top of the gesso. So if you use transparent watercolor heavy handed, take indigo, for example, and you mix up something heavier than heavy cream, thick, uh, and lay it down on top of that surface, it has a tendency to dry a little shiny. So you have to sort of be careful. And sometimes it'll even lift itself and you have to keep going over it to make it dark enough. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Yep. Uh, do you, uh, Kinsley wants to know, do you use a fixative after you've uh, painted your watercolors on gesso paper? Yeah, I do. Um, um, this is uh, watercolor and gouache and water soluble graphite on UPO. And because UPO lifts so readily, usually when these are done, I take them out in the driveway and I spray them with golden archival spray matte varnish, two coats, different directions. I haven't found the need to spray these paintings, which are on gesso. Okay. So here's one I completed as a demonstration not too awful long ago. Um, and the whole paper was covered with this dark. And so I just lifted the sky shapes out of that surface and then lifted the trunk shapes and dropped color back into those for the shapes of the, the pine tree trunk. And then I haven't found the need to have to spray these. This will come up readily. I mean, here's my finger wet. So um. that's, that's lifting. From my hmm. wet from my finger, um, but but I mat and frame these traditionally, so that would be backing board, and then archival mat, and then most of the time I use plex, and then plex and a frame. So they're traditionally matted and framed, um, like well any watercolor on paper. So I don't spray my uh, water, water, traditional watercolors. I don't spray these nor do I spray the watercolor on the gesso paper. But I do spray the UPO ones only because that surface is way more delicate. Right, yeah. yeah. 
Okay, now Todd and Lynn Roger have a question. They want to know, what do you find is the difference between painting on gessoed paper and the UPO? Yeah, that's a really good question because during the workshop, we start on untreated cotton paper, traditional transparent watercolor on cotton paper. And we do a bunch of paintings, small, but a bunch. And then the transition, still staying representational for a day, is to the gessoed surface. But that gessoed surface is, is the paint is readily liftable and mixable on the surface. And a lot of the texturizing and, and useful techniques that you do on UPO can also be done on the gessoed surface. So it's a really good transition from co untreated cotton paper to UPO, which is like painting on glass sometimes. It's so slippery. Um, <laughs> and so the 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 Manipulation of paint on the gessoed surface, people will learn a lot about lifting and negative painting and what can be done. And then that all applies to you both, that slippery plastic surface that some people mm -hmm. hate. Right. Oh, yeah. Some people yep. don't like that I, but it's fun to play on. It is. Uh, fun. Sue Beach wants to know do you ever work on ungessoed watercolor paper? You mean untreated watercolor paper? Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah all the time. Uh, okay. Yes. It's just like these two are untreated watercolor paper. And all of the ones I could share with you are somewhere between 27 by 35 inches in a flat file over here. So hard to share when all I can do in this venue right. is a, a quarter sheet. But absolutely. I started with transparent watercolor with a little praying set at the age of 10 and never stopped with transparent watercolor. Right. Uh, Nancy wants to know when you're painting with acrylics outside, how do you keep the paints on the palette from drying up? I paint really fast. <laughs> there well, you go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, seriously. So uh, nine by 12 painting or 11 by 14 painting, even a 12 by 16 painting seldom takes me longer than an hour. So I, I don't have, I never spritz my, paint that's in the palette. I do use a Masterson palette that has a sponge. So a sponge and then palette paper and then squirt out my acrylic and then paint like a crazy person um, to make sure that things don't dry out. Sometimes if it's really windy and hot, I'll get a film over top of my acrylics and I just use my brush and punch through the skin, mm -hmm. that skin that forms on and to get to the wet paint that's underneath and keep going. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, he I, definitely I, was a, a plain air painter, huh? Um, yes. Yeah, I'm, Mark, I'm really fast outdoors. Yeah. Yeah. You, in Florida, you have to be. Yeah. Uh, and that's also part of the problem, I think. Well, uh, Y'all have, have snakes and alligators, too. I set up to paint in Florida once and looked down and all I saw was a bunch of small alligators, you know, little ones like <laughs> this. And then I looked closer and I could see the nostrils of mama, not, not three feet from where I was standing. And so I kind of had to grab my easel and slowly back up out of there and didn't do the painting there. <laughs> oh, I, I imagine not. Yeah. Oh. Um, Mark, uh, we have a question about how archival is the watercolor gesso uh, combination. I, I'm sorry. Start Say it again, Roberta. Uh, when you're painting on this gesso watercolor paper, uh -huh. how archival is it? Um, it's archival paper, acid free, with the same gesso that people put underneath oils and acrylic paintings. There's nothing unarchival about it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would think it would be too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, the, the pigments that we use, um, barring a few few colors are also very archival. So the ultramarine blue that they use for watercolor is the same ultramarine blue powdered pigment that they use for oil and acrylic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Okay. Um, we have a question from Edie. She wants to know, how do you start your abstracts? Is there much planning involved in that? <laughs> um, yes and no. That's a really good question. So uh, I can sort of show with two pieces of paper. Lots of times what I'll do is I will dump a lot of paint on paper and I'll just do like a mini of, of, of what I do. 
That's a really good question. We'll use old uh, cobalt blue because it got it was wet. So here's a bunch of paint cobalt blue on this paper. And then just to be obstinate, we'll put some yellow and might as well do all primary, huh? Okay. <laughs> well, there's red. So now I have a bunch of paint on there, which I can manipulate any number of ways because it's UPO. But usually what I do is cover the whole paper, make sure it's wet. And then I pull a mono print. So I'll pull a mono print like this and then remove paint. So then I end up with a shape. There'll be a shape, an edge underneath here. Yeah, which allows me to start the design process. So there's the corner, here's a shape, a rectangular shape. Here's another shape on this piece of paper. So I will often start the design process with a monoprint. Really good question. Yeah, that was uh, that was a very interesting answer too. How about that? Okay. Um, Mark, uh, one of our folks wants to know what your plain air travel kit is like. What do you take with you when you go on your trips? Um, yeah, I probably will not travel to Florida with the plain air kit. Um, although I do keep a set of watercolors and a, a watercolor block in my room. So when I'm done teaching for the day and I go back to my air conditioned room, because I'm a cool weather person, um, I will often paint even after class. My plein air kit consists of a tripod, lightweight tripod, and then a lightweight aluminum easel that fits on top of the tripod, and then a shelf um, by Sun Eden, and then I have another one plein air by plein air pro that fits on the tripod, and then a box of my split primary palette that I use 90% of the time. So that's a warm and a cool of each of the primaries plus white. Um, mm -hmm. A water bottle, water, paper towels, um, and then my brushes. And um, that's it. And a painting panel or two, depending on how much time I have. So that, that's it. It all fits in a backpack because um, some of my painting sites are close. I can get out of my truck and paint. And other times I might have to hike a mile or two or even more to get to where I want to paint that day. Wow. So okay. Everything's in a backpack. The more you decide you want to bring plain air painting, the more you will carry plain air painting. And the older I get, the less I want to carry. Yeah, really. Yeah, um, I hear you there. Um, do you ever use fluid acrylics in your layering process? No. Um, okay. Part of that, the um, I can't say no. Um, yes, I use fluid acrylics, but um, on canvas. So behind me in the studio sits um, my big easel, which will accommodate a canvas sixty by sixty, and so I work quite large during doing the same non-objective paintings that I do 20 by 26 on UPO. Um, and so those canvases, I will use fluid acrylics, heavy bodied acrylics, all sorts of stencils that I've created and any other tool that I think might make a good painting. Okay. Um, Deborah wants to know if that golden gesso, is it transparent or white? White. 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 Okay. Although, you know, I've not tried the transparent gesso. If it's made by Golden, I think it might work. Um, I would suggest just try it. Okay. Yeah. Um, then uh, we have another uh, gesso question. Uh, what are the benefits of uh, applying the gesso to both sides of the paper? Yeah. If you apply it to just one side, because of uneven drying, it's going to do this. So as that side dries and you have just one, it'll curl on you. And so I put two coats on both sides, then, then it dries flat, completely so flat. I, use, I, use, one, I do I, use 300 pound. I mean, you can get away with 140 pound, but I've just gone to 300 pound because it stays flat for me. Also, if you mess up on one side, <laughs> 
you and it doesn't wipe off the way you'd like it, you can always flip it over and paint on the other side. Okay. And then somebody also wanted to know, do you dilute the gesso when you're applying it to your paper? I don't. It's right straight out of the container. Yep. Yeah. Okay. You can apply it like... Um, if you want to try before I get there in September, it's quite interesting. You'll get different effects from different surfaces, but take hot press. This is hot press watercolor paper. If you take hot press watercolor paper and take and apply your first coat of gesso with a foam roller. Mm -hmm. So now it's very smooth application on a very smooth piece of paper. Let it dry, sand it, uh, maybe 220 grit, 400 grit. So that it's even smoother, brush it off, put another coat of gesso down with the roller, light touch, sand that. And then you have a very smooth plate finish that's actually easier to lift and gives more interesting effects from gravity than working on a cold press piece of watercolor paper. But you wouldn't get the granulation like you did on the other, right? Not quite the same because you don't have those valleys for the paint to fall into with that surface. Right. Okay. Yep. Um, and then uh, we have a, a question here. If you would take your camera and show us around your studio. Oh, <laughs> uh, I can't do that. Because, well, just, no, I can't do it. The uh, My connection here, let me go back to me. Um, my connection... Sorry. Okay. So this connection from this webcam, which points down there, is all taped and wrapped around everything. And then into my, actually my wife's laptop, which is where you're seeing me. So if I were to unhook uh, to walk around, we'd be unhooking. It, the, our meeting would be over right then and there. <laughs> well, that, that's a good answer there. Okay. That looks like that's all of our questions here, well, Mark. Good. Yeah. This has been very exciting. Uh, we I look forward to my visit. I, you know, Florida, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think is still the largest watercolor society in the country, only because California is broken up with different societies. And I'm, I'm not counting American and national because those are just right. national. But Florida is the largest state society with the largest membership in the country. So I always look forward to the entries that people send in and the enthusiasm of everybody and the con convention where I can spend money and buy stuff. So it's always a lot of fun.